Alexandria Lynn's room was they think we ran classes. That is not what we ran. We ran camera equipment. Um, my slides aren't black the whole time, so I hope that you can see them better. Uh, I'm really glad to be here uh, from Memphis. Um, I have to confess, though, I'm terrified of public speaking. Um, to the point that when I was in college, I took my public speaking class online. So, uh, fun to be here and give this a shot. Uh, today I'm mostly going to be talking about Ruby. Um, show of hands, I guess, who here has at least worked with Ruby before? Cool. Yay. Um, so yeah, it's Ruby Heavy Talk. Um, uh, so I apologize in advance if Ruby isn't your thing. Uh, if you're not in the web development or Ruby, here are the top six games on iTunes right now. You can go download. <laughs> you should have about 30 minutes to advance in those. Um, anyway, so we are, uh, Lynch Mills is a Ruby on Rails shop. Um, today, we make a lot of comparison to Rails because it's kind of my, my home a little bit. Um, me, personally, I was actually a little late to the Ruby party. Uh, I showed up in 2012. But four years later, still loving it. Uh, still like Ryan Ruby. It's still a lot of fun to me. Um, but like I said, kind of along with Ruby, I do a lot of Rails. Uh, and I would, wow, you can't say that at all. Uh, and like most Rails developers, um, for me, what I see, it seems like we came into you know, to Ruby because of it. But uh, yeah, there's also some other Ruby frameworks out there. If you actually Google alternative Ruby frameworks, one of the PJ's articles comes up, and Elis Sinatra, um, popular micro, micro framework. Uh, there's also Padrino, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, I actually haven't worked with that one much. Built on top of Sinatra, lets you pick and choose what you like. Cuba, micro framework, uh, I guess a lot of APIs. Uh, I listed Volt, but I marked it up because Volt isn't actually, uh, doesn't seem to be under much development right now. But it lets you run, um, lets you run Ruby client and server side, which is kind of cool. And there's a few others um, that I'm missing, but from that list, there are a few things that are missing. There's one thing that kind of stands out to me that's missing. We don't necessarily have a ton of options for, I guess, more opinionated full stack. Uh, frameworks. I'm scared to use the term full stack now today, but uh, there is one I found and it's called Hanami. And go ahead and just read you what Hanami is. This is from their website. It's a Ruby uh, model view controller web framework comprised of many micro libraries. It has a simple, stable API, minimal DSL, and priorities. Uh, prioritizes the use of plain objects over magical, overcomplicated classes with too much responsibility. Um, so the guy who created Anami, his name is Luca. Um, he uh, actually had a chance to talk to him this week, and he was super nice, uh, answered a lot of questions for me. Um, you may have heard of this project. It was called Lotus for a little while. Um, somebody from IBM was like, hey, maybe don't use that name. <laughs> and so now it's called Anami. Um, but I was asking him, I said, hey, if I'm talking to a room full of people and maybe they don't know about Anami, what's like, what do you want them to walk away with if nothing? He gave me a few things. I want you to know that Anami is full featured. We'll try to take a look at some of that today. It's lightweight. Um, actually, when I asked him how he got started, he told me to start it with Rack. And then just started taking the smallest steps, be lightweight from there. It's built for long term applications, so it's designed that uh, as your application grows and your features grow, that it's easier to maintain. And then also, uh, it's built so you can write testable code. All right. I only have so much time to go over stuff. Um, frameworks as a whole are just, it'd be hard to cover everything. 
So uh, one thing I'm just going to say is that don't focus I guess, too much on the actual code. Um, it may be easy to read, it may not. But more or less, I kind of want to talk about Hanabi's uh, architectural approach to things. I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, like I said, today's going to be a code-heavy walkthrough, um, and uh, more or less looking for the architecture of things. Um, there is a warning, I guess, on the website. Uh, it says, this is actually from Luke himself, it says, I warn you that whether you are a total beginner or an experienced developer, this learning process can be hard. After 10 years, you develop a way of working, and it can be painful for you to change. However, without change, there's no challenge. So with that all said, let's take a look at my mommy. As any good Ruby project, we can install it. Jim installed Hanami and has 20 dependencies it relies on. Um, I don't know if you can see, there's really, there's really two sections. Um, you have some actual Hanami gems, and they're all the router, controller, view, models, they're all based on individual modules. But then you also have um, these gems that start with dry. Now we started working with dry RB recently, and I haven't done a ton of research. Oh no, I had the dry RB website embedded, but it's on HTTPS, so we're all screwed. All right, never mind. So we'll keep on. Um, so creating a Hanami application, just like a Rails application, or Similar is we have uh, we have command line tools, so we can say Hanami new bookshelf, and it will create all the files. I should also mention that these uh, these examples are from Hanami's website. Um, I figure I could write my own application, or I could just use one that's pretty good already. So once we do that, this is what our root directory looks like: gem file, rake file. We have apps directory, which we'll look at. Config directory. Um, Rack file, database directory, lib directory, and then a spec folder. So um, once you do that, you just bundle install, get all your dependencies installed, and then bundle looks at Hanami server will actually start up a Hanami server, um, port 2300, and this is this is where you get after all that. So not too bad to actually just get something on the page. But what I want to do today, um, I want to walk through just building a feature, and we're going to do it uh, test-driven development style. We're going to try and write the test to fail and then pass. Um, we'll see how well that goes. So our first test is a feature test, and we want to, uh, we'll just read it kind of like English. When we visit the home page, uh, we want to check that page loaded successfully. So when we visit the root URL, uh, the body should just have the word bookshelf on it. Simple enough. Run that. Fails just like we wanted. Cool. So um, let's just walk through the steps to get bookshelf on the page. So we need a route. So pretty standard route. We just want uh, we want a route whenever you visit just the, the entry point of the site to go to the home controller and an index action. Easy enough, feels like standard Ruby. So from there, let's make a home controller. And this is where things, for me, are kind of like, what is happening now? Um, and it's actually kind of cool, it just took me a while to understand. So if you look in our apps directory, we have a web app, we have a controllers directory, then instead of having just a home controller uh, filled with a bunch of actions, we actually have a home directory, and then uh, our action, which is index, is its own Ruby class. So what happens here is we wrap that class in a module, it's namespace, web, controllers, home, and then whenever we, um, whenever we hit this, it's actually looking for that call method, so we define that, pass in the params, and then to get our actual Hanami functionality, instead of inheriting from something like um, application controller or something like that, we're actually including uh, a module web action. 
So when I first looked at this, it was really confused as well. But it starts to kind of make sense the more I looked at it, because everything's really isolated. So when I start having more actions in their own classes, and for me, um, I started thinking about all the times I've written private methods and controllers that are just linked to one action, and then all of a sudden my controllers are huge, and every web developer hates me. Um, so the next one you need to add is a view. Um, once again, I said we compare it to Rails a lot. So in Rails, we would just, from there, we have a template. Um, and it would just be like index, uh, or just be yeah, at home directory index.html erb or handle. But here we actually have another class. So it follows the same kind of structure, views, home, index class, namespace, and web views home module. And then we're including web view. Um, I think we'll hit this a little bit later on. Um, but this, what this file does is it'll actually then render the template. But what's nice is you can keep some of your logic out of your actual template and put it into this file. So that said, we add our HTML. We're not rendering any data right now, so it's just an H1 tag. So it's easy enough if we step back and we look at our test. Well, when we visit the home, when we visit the root of the site, well, okay, so we have a route, and it goes to that controller, and that controller calls that view, and that view renders that template that has a bookshelf on it. Yay, all those things. Well, then we're passing now. So that's kind of a high level overview of at least the HTT part of things. Um, but from there, it's not very exciting, right? We, we, should, we work with data, so let's make a model. Well, uh, from here on out, I'm going to use some of Panami's uh, code generators. So what we can do here, we'll just say Panami generate model, and we want to make a book. So one thing I'll go ahead and point out here is that it created a book entity in a book repository. So um, Hanami actually separates your domain logic and your persistence layer. We'll kind of look at that here. So yeah, so there's a slide that says that. And then the two act <coughs> together. So something like Active Record, we inherit from Active Record. And then it just that persistence is magically there. Um, here it's a little more explicit. So any, uh, your, your actual entity, your model, doesn't know anything about how it gets stored in a database. But the two work together because you have a repository. So entities are repositories. <clears throat> but before I move any further, um, some of what I'm about to show and I'll try to point out is about to change. Um, Anami is in 0.8 version right now. And I think they're working towards 1.0. So, uh, some of the core principles, entities, and repositories will say the same, but take that with a grain of salt as we keep going. All right. So entities uh, is something really close to a plain Ruby object. It doesn't know anything about database structure, and it focuses on the behaviors that we want from it, and only then how to save them. So if we look at the entity that was generated for us, the book, sure enough, it's just a class named book, we define some attributes, so we want a book to have a title and an author, and then we just want to bring in the Hanami-related functionality by including the Hanami entity. Uh, an example of what that brings in is it's automatically going to have an attribute for ID, things like that, so don't have to explicitly call that. And then there's an example of the test, a little backwards, not DDD, sorry. Um, but we can just say, Hey, if we say book dot here and we pass in the title refactory, then the book title should equal refactory. Sure enough, it does this. If we try to say book dot your release, then it would just be like, I don't know what you're talking about. So that's where the attributes come to play the entities. So you're in that test, it passes. Okay, cool. So we've gone down the HTTP layer, we've looked at entities, but we actually want to save that stuff to a database because otherwise um, our entity can only take us so far. So how do we do that? Repositories. Um, repositories are what read and write our models from the database. 
So, um, sure enough, all we need to do first to get our database set up. Command line is Hanami DB create. We'll have an empty database. But now we need a books table underneath it. So, handy, another handy uh, tool to say Hanami generate migration. We're going to create a books table. Well, migration, if you come from Rails, you'll be pretty familiar. Um, so, it's this method called create tables. We want to create table, we want to books. We pass in a block. We have a primary key of ID, call and title. Um, we don't want it to ever be null. We have author, we don't ever want it to be null. Pretty standard. We migrate and we have table. Nothing too fancy there. This next thing I'm about to show you, I think, is something that's going to change. Um, so, right now, Hanami kind of, we have the two separated so they need to know how to interconnect. Right now, they use the data mapper to do that. So you would, in your uh, bookshelf RB file, which is the project file, the link directory, there's already a method in there called mapping. Um, and so you would just say, I have a collection called books. And for every, if I have a book entity, well, I want that to map up with the book repository. That's how the two work together, save the database, form the database. These are the attributes that I'm expecting that should match a column. But like I said, I think that's about to change, so don't worry about that too much. All right. So um, just to kind of show how the two work together, we open up a REPL and we call book repository.all. Well, we have nothing in our database, so it returns empty array. So let's try and save a book. We'll, we'll say book.new, give it a title and an author. We save that to a variable. Turn it off, there's our book object. <coughs> well, if we want to persist that to the database, um, typically you could, if you have this in like an active record type environment, you would call save. But here, we explicitly say book repository.create, and we pass in our entity. And then you'll notice that it returns title, author, but now it has an ID attribute because it's in our database and we pass back an ID. So then also you can say book repository.find, pass the ID. So that's how the two work together, a real high level overview of that. Um, okay. Get ahead of myself here. So we're about 20 minutes in. I, uh, we're going to go ahead and start abandoning the TDD approach, like any project that ever starts with TDD. Stop halfway through. Um, and we're going to just kind of roll through here. So now we have data, it's in our database, we have entities, we have views, we have all these things, so I'll start trying to put it together a little bit. So this is our, uh, I should say, templates home index HTML ERB. So all we're doing is we're saying, well, there's any books, let's loop through them, put a div with the title and the author. If there's no books, hey, there's no books. Yeah, so pretty simple DRB code. So at this point, though, we're calling books. Well, how do we get books down that layer to the template? So here, what we're doing. This is, oh, oh, oh. This is the same uh, controller from earlier, but all we're doing now is we're calling a method expose, and we're saying books. So what that expose method does is actually allow you to access that from the template. So we have an instance variable books equals book repository.all. If that expose method wasn't there, the template would have no idea what books is. So instead of just every instance variable being available to the template, we actually have a little more control over what we allow through. So if you pull up the site now, well, that's what it would look like. And at this point, when I was first starting, I was so thrilled to get this far. Um, but uh, there's one other thing we have time for, so I want to look at. Uh, let's look at, actually, we know how to save entities to a database. We know all the view stuff. 
Now let's merge these together into more important forms because we're web developers, blah, blah, blah. So, um, Anami has another CLI for this, so we can generate an action, and it's in our web folder, which I'll explain at the end. And we want it to be books controller with a new action. So we run that. Anami appends this route to the routes file for us, so um, get books new, maps to books controller new. Then in our template, um, we open up a, a form method. So this looks a little different from um, the way other web frameworks do forms. Um, you still have form for it's for a book, and when you submit it, it should go to it should post to books. But instead of chopping it up where you'll close off an ERB tag, put some HTML or something, and close it off or open up again, a lot of open and closing. This is just one uh, full set of Ruby code. And so you can uh, call div, give it a class, and then pass it your attributes for label and text field. So this will actually build that form for you in just one valid uh, Ruby method. And so this will give us this, we have a form. So, if we hit submit, it's just going to blow up. So, we'll add another action and we'll say we want a create method and we want it to actually be the method type post because uh, we're submitting our form. So, once again, this will append to the routes file for us. It'll actually, though, be post method now instead of get. And we post to books, it should take us to books, controller, create, action. That is the exact same slot. Um, so similar to how we had uh, when we did new, we exposed book, and then what we're doing now though is we're it's, when we actually call this, we'll work our way down that call method. So we say book repository dot create. We want to save this to the database, and then we just want a new entity book dot new and pass in our book params. So pretty pretty standard code there, and then when we're done, let's just redirect to the home page. And so sure enough, when you run this, and you hit enter, it saves, it. saves it to a database. So I mentioned that I would come back to that web folder. So you'll notice that the apps folder is pluralized. You can have multiple apps inside of one Hanami application. So this is nice, like if you had an admin dashboard or something like that, you can actually separate that out. So instead of apps web, you'd have apps admin. So you kind of isolate all the different maybe areas of your application, but they all share the same entities and repositories because your entities and repositories are in the lib folder. That's just something I wanted to mention because I find that very neat. So. Kind of wrap it up. I said this thing was full featured. I only went through a little bit of it. So I'm going to just list out some of the features. These are all your available HTML5 helpers. So you've got four, four, hidden field, number field, all the things you come to expect for a form. And then these are all the other things that it covers. You've got parameters, uh, montage, sharing, you can share code uh, between apps, things like that. A lot of stuff that we don't have time to cover today. Um, so really the thing that, if anything, I want you to kind of take away from what Hanami, how it's different from other applications, is that it's less magic. So you could say that um, Hanami uh, kind of gets more explicit over implicit. To me, I kind of enjoy that. I still like working at Rails a lot, but it's it's nice to have something else to kind of work with in Ruby. But really, I guess it kind of comes down to your preference. Some people like the magic, some people like being explicit. Um, I like the balance of both. So if you're interested in Hanami, website has just the most phenomenal guides. That's what all these code samples are pulled from. 
you can check it out on GitHub. It's actually the first open source project that I was able to contribute to, so that was kind of cool. Um, they're on Twitter, and then they've got I think it's a Gitter chats with chat.mrb.org. And that's actually all I have, so maybe, maybe we'll be back on the schedule. So, um, I'm not going to ask your questions because I'm super awkward. So if you want to come up to me and ask me a question, that would be awesome because then we can meet and like talk. But right here I'm just like, Ugh. so thank you guys.